like you to turn to James chapter 3. So if, if I am meddling today, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> but God meddles with us. And uh, so before I start my sermon, though, I just want to say a couple things. One is that perhaps some of you saw the, and I didn't watch it, I just saw enough of the posts on Facebook to get a really, really good idea of the Grammys that happened in our country. And in my opinion, uh, it was pretty disgusting. And uh, it was the in-your-face kind of exposure of the enemy that believers have today and have had since the beginning of time. <laughs> um, so uh, there are a couple of responses to that. Uh, my response to that was, this is uh, this was out in the open for the world to see that there is a devil and there are people who follow him and who uh, want to parade him before our country. But for me, it just energizes me, in a sense, to just keep doing what we're doing, keep teaching the Word of God, keep in the book, keep keep uh, communicating God's truth, and hopefully living by it. Uh, doesn't really change anything. Uh, we just need to do our job as a church. That's what I'm saying. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. So, and uh, there was something else that I knew was really important that I was going to tell you, but I can't remember. So. Okay, James chapter 3. So Solomon, if you are, uh, you spend time in the book of Proverbs, and you read the book of Proverbs very much, you will find out that Solomon had a great deal to write about the tongue, or the mouth, or words, or the lips. In fact, you will find that he talks about that topic something like 150 times in the book of Proverbs alone. So it must be a problem yes. that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> and I, I think it is. So uh, we're going to be looking at, think of that, Proverbs 15, 2, you can just jot this down if you want, but Proverbs 15, 2 says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. Um, and here's what Jesus taught, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. So what we hear, what we hear said, what comes over the lips and out of our mouth, really comes from right there. And the problem that we have is not so much the lips as it is the heart. Um, there was a lady that I worked with. She was kind of the assistant director of security at a nice hotel in Dallas back in the day. And, you know, she was, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> I never heard up till then a young woman talk like that. <laughs> I mean, I just, I was embarrassed. And, and I know that there must have been reasons for it, and she was trying to, you know, prove herself and, and to communicate, but she was, there was so much pollution that came out of her mouth all the time. <laughs> she was a pretty nice person, but anyway, I, it's funny. That, that Chuck Swindoll says, our problem is deeper than our lips or tongue. Our problem is with the heart. Like a bucket draws water from a well, so the tongue dips down and pours out whatever is in the heart. If the source is clean, that which, that is, sorry, that is what the tongue communicates. 
If it is contaminated, again, the tongue will expose it. So the tongue exposes the heart. It's pretty amazing. But the question for us this morning is, what did James, what does he have to teach us about this thing called the tongue? Um, I, and I also remember one other time when I was totally um, embarrassed. I was embarrassed for the movie industry. Um, and, you know, you can say I'm an old guy and, you know, that's, that shows how old you are and how out of old fashioned you are and all of that. But somehow I got to watching the movie Martian. And I'm not recommending that movie. In fact, after I watched Matt Damon standing on Mars, screaming F-bombs at the world, I thought I am embarrassed for him that that's what uh, would come out of mouth for the whole world to hear. Uh, it just, so, I know he's an actor, but still, um, somebody had wrote those words down for all of us to hear. And uh, it was pretty, pretty embarrassing to me. So let's look at James chapter 3, in case you want to know what this is, you can talk to... Uh, Kyle or Brianna, or I saw one of the cowboy hats leave here. I was going to have someone come up and help me. <laughs> this is called a bit bridle, by the way. Anybody recognize that? Yeah. I remember putting that on a horse overnight when I was a kid. I used to, I used to, um, you know, they, we had a, a kind of a, a fair horse, kind of had a limp. And uh, when my brother and I were over there in the summers, we would often ask if we could go out horseback riding just to go down and get the mail. So we were kind of small to be doing that. So I remember getting on that horse and cinching it up and putting a bit and bridle on the horse and, and then kicking that poor horse, kicking that horse. And he, he did not want to go down the driveway and down the hill, down to the highway, <coughs> get the mail and come all the way back up to the barn. He really wanted to come back to the barn, but he didn't want to go down. <laughs> it was pretty funny. So uh, yeah, I remember kicking him and kicking him and kicking him all the way down with my tennis shoes and, uh, and then almost getting my arm ripped off when I was grabbing the mail because he was heading back up to the barn where he could get some food, you know. So I didn't really know how to ride very well and how to control the, the horse but uh, so anyway James uses that imagery though he uses the imagery of a bit and bridle and a horse and other imagery here so he, it's very colorful and uh, James is going to hit us where we live so in James chapter 3 verse 1 it says let not, let not many of you become teachers my brethren knowing that as such we will in incur a stricter judgment the way that that is written in the original language it means it's it's a construction that means stop stop becoming teachers um, it's not like teaching is a bad thing don't become a rabbi don't become a teacher but he just says if you're going to do it that way stop it that's really what it means in the greek it says uh, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such you will incur a stricter judgment. And that he begins this chapter with a command. It's in the imperatives. It don't stop uh, becoming teachers, my brethren, knowing that you will incur a stricter judgment. And uh, we are all commanded by God, expected by God to teach, right? I mean, Jesus in the Great Commission says, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. What? Teaching them to pay attention and to learn or to obey my teachings. So in the Great Commission, he says we have a responsibility to teach. Just flip over for a second, one book to the left, James chapter 5, <coughs> and verse 12. Hebrews 
5.12, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 5, verse 12 says, For though, speaking to probably to Jewish believers, he says, For though by this time, by this time, after the passing of years, after the passing of time, um, you ought to be teachers. And I'm just going to say that today. God, God's people over time ought to become and with, have the ability to teach others, to pass truth on. In fact, the writer goes on to say, you have need instead for someone to teach you. And that's an indictment on the believers at that time who were tempted to fall away. He says, by this time, you ought to be able to teach. You ought to be able to... And, and I'm just going to tell you, sometimes we're discouraged. We think, I didn't go to seminary. I, I don't know enough. So how could I ever become a teacher? And I'm going to tell you, if you, this is the secret of teaching. You just have to know a little bit more than your class knows. I'm serious. You have to study. You have to prepare. You have to, you know, do your diligence to prepare uh, to, to be a teacher. But you don't have to know everything. You just have to know a little more than they do. And so uh, that's how it works. So, yes, <clears throat> every Christian is responsible to teach, to share, to impart. Fathers have a responsibility to teach and impart to their children the truth. Um, and, and so on. I think grandparents have a great opportunity to teach and impart to their grandchildren. However, James was evidently speaking of people becoming teachers like rabbis <coughs> in this day, uh, in our day, who are professional teachers. He may have been cautioning those who were considering teaching in the church and suggesting that some who were ministering in this capacity unworthily should step down. So I think James is just saying, we're all supposed to be teachers, but those who are teachers may need to be care. You need to be very careful. And if you're not doing it right, maybe you need to step down. So that's, that's pretty, pretty strong words. Teachers are necessary, but incompetent and unworthy ones do much harm. Okay. So that's all I think he's saying here. Um, and the Jewish people regarded teachers or rabbis with great respect, with a great deal of respect. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 23 and verse 8 tells us that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but do not be called rabbi. I mean, that's what Jesus thought. Don't be, don't be called rabbi. <laughs> be careful if you're going to step into that role. For one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. So um, the synagogue service allowed the opportunity for men in the congregation to stand up and address the assembly, and Christians carried this opportunity over into the meetings of the early church. And consequently, there were many in James' audience who thought, um, who though not qualified with ability, aspired to teach others publicly for the sake of prestige and some other motive. So I think James is just saying we need to be really careful. And his basic underlying argument here is that the tongue is untamable. I mean, there are lots of things that we struggle with. I know in our culture, I, used, I remember going down to the, the new little shell station down here years ago, and I looked in here and I said, this store is full of things that are addictive. They are. Everything you see, there was fat food, grease, you know, there was sugar, there was nicotine, there was pornography over there if you wanted it, there was... Um, alcohol, um, there was gambling, you could buy tickets. I mean, all of it. I, that's how they make money, guys. Don't you think so? It is. I mean, I, there may have been some good stuff in there. But in general, it was very addicting. But James is going to say that the most 
difficult thing at the top of the list for us to control is this. And frankly, if we can control this, we can control the whole body. And so uh, it's a pretty interesting concept. So, <clears throat> um, verse 2, James chapter 3. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, what's the answer? If anybody could not stumble with their mouth, with their tongue, then what's, what does he say about that? He would be perfect. He would be perfect. So the standard is pretty high. Um, so uh, we all stumble. We all stumble. It reminds me of Romans 3.23, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all of us miss the standard. All of us miss the mark. But James is not going to just let it go. He's expecting us to do something about it. <clears throat> and here's the problem. The, the person who speaks much is going to err in what he says or what she says. Sooner or later, they're going to record you on social media and they're going to bring it back to haunt you. Remember what you said? Uh, I remember what you said. I remember that about you. <clears throat> so the person who speaks much is going to err or stumble much in his or her speech because the tongue is the hardest member of the body to control. No one has been able to master it except Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you remember when Jesus was brought before Pilate and he fulfilled the prophecy from the book of Isaiah about not opening his mouth. I, I think our greatest example is Christ when he was on trial, when he was being uh, uh, interviewed by Pilate and he did not open his mouth. He, he was reviled and did not revile in return. What an example for us to follow. Amen? Although not all sins laid to the account of one person are necessarily the same as those shared by others, all persons have at least one sin in common. Your sin might be stealing or murder or something, but we all have, I'm joking, we all have the sin of controlling this. We all do. And uh, so, so number three, <clears throat> uh, in James chapter three and verse three, he goes on to say, now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, um, we will direct their entire body also. How many of you understand what that, from experience, what, what that means? Yeah. How that works. How many of you put a bit and bridle into, or a bit into the mouth of a horse? Deb, yeah. And, you know, as a, it's used for controlling or keeping the horse under control. It is the same with horses as it is with humans. If we can control the tongue, we can bring the whole animal under control. Uh, it's just a small bit. This is not real big, is it? I mean, that's not real big, is it? How big is a horse? How much does a horse weigh, Brianna? How much? Thousand. Thousand? Okay. But look at that little thing. And with that little thing, if you can bring that under control, you can control the whole horse, right? Usually. For the most part. For the most part. <laughs> I know it's a learned thing. So I'm not a horse guy. So I, there are lots of horse people in this room. I know about that. So James is just saying that with a small bit, we can control a large horse. He also uses the imagery in verse 4 of 
a, a big ship which only needs a small rudder to turn. So, uh, you know, it, James 3, 4 says, look at the ships also. I love James. I feel like he's just like his brother Jesus. Jesus said, look at the birds. Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field. And here James is saying, look at the ships. Look at the horses. I'm teaching you something, and it's very um, a great picture. It says, look at the ships also. Uh, though they have so great, they, so that they are so great and driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder. I think James, who grew up on the Sea of Galilee, saw many ships on the Sea of Galilee. I think he probably saw ships on the Mediterranean Sea and he totally understood that there's a great ship. He, he probably rode in ships uh, and they were pushed along by strong winds, to, but they were directed, steered by a very small rudder. It's pretty simple mm -hmm. to understand. And then in verse five, he just compares that to the tongue. The tongue is also small, but it can do big things. It can brag, it can boast, it can do all kinds of things, good or bad. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a fire. You know, one time my family took a, went to a family reunion over at Lake Chelan at the park over there, and it was kind of a hot July time over there, sagebrush everywhere, and, and there were some kids that were out setting fireworks off, and they, just a little firework started a fire. And I'm telling you, it was pretty amazing to see. There were, you know, tankers that fly to put out fires coming over the hill and going down and, and uh, having to put out a big forest fire, but it just started with a little, little firework, you know? So that's what James is saying here. See, also, so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Um, so, can you just take your Bible and I'm going to do this real quickly, but I want to just show you that it's, it's universal, this issue, this problem. Um, first of all, let's look quickly at Ephesians 4.29. Some of you have memorized that verse. Ephesians 4.29, okay? Um, anybody here, can anybody here say it from memory? Any of you guys? who have been working on it. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Paul said that. But only such a word as is good for edification, for building up other people. Wow, that ought to give us some homework this week, right? Everything that I say to my wife is going to be for her edification. Everything I say to my kids, everything I say to the TV, you know, everything I say to the politicians, you know, or everything that comes out of my mouth uh, to another human being is meant to be for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Giving grace. It will edify, it will build up. Uh, Philippians 2, right? The next book over from Ephesians. Philippians 2, 14. This is another couple verses that we've been working on. It says, do... <laughs> oh, Mark, I see you smiling. Your turn, buddy. Do all things without grumbling. And 15. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of the crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Okay, so how's he doing on that, Katie? Okay. 
How's Mark doing with that? <laughs> uh, Mark, how's Teddy doing with that? Let's be fair. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that verse is just amazing to me because it's pretty black and white, pretty all or nothing. I mean, our goal, our, the, the desire of God is, it says, do all things without grumbling. Are you a grumbler? I think grumbling has been a problem from time and from forever. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. God calls us to speak in a way that's different. That's all I'm saying. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter 6 for a minute quickly. We've got to hurry. We've got to get going here. Yep, we do. Acts chapter 6. Oh, it's in the New Testament, Acts, Romans, right in between John. So if you remember, you know, even in the early church, uh, the early believers, I think, needed to read James. Because it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, now at that time, the disciples were increasing in number. And what happened? A complaint. <laughs> A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily uh, serving of food. Uh, you know, it's, it's all through the New Testament, that, that issue. So, uh, the second thing I want to say, if we look back at James chapter 3, verse 6, is that uh, this, the tongue has destructive power. It says in verse 6 of James 3, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. That's pretty graphic. But he's saying the tongue has destructive power. The tongue has as much destructive power as a spark that can ignite a large forest. It is petite but powerful. Fire is a good illustration of the tongue's effect, its potential. It says a world of unrighteousness, perverse as well as powerful. So, um, all the evil characteristics, this is one commentator wrote, all the evil characteristics of a fallen world, its covetousness, its idolatry, its blasphemy, its lust, its rapacious greed, find expression through the tongue. From the context, it seems best to accept that James thinks that of the tongue as a vast system of iniquity. One more quote, the, the tongue is the gate through which the evil influences of hell can spread like fire to inflame all the areas of life that we touch. Mm -hmm. This is the only place in the New Testament where the word hell occurs outside of the Synoptic Gospels. Here, the entire body represents the whole person. However, it may also allude to the church. So the, the tongue has destructive power. Verses 7 and 8 of James uh, says, For every species of beasts um, of bir and birds and of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. I want to just tell you that it probably in the original language doesn't mean tamed, like tamed and you're done taming it. It's more like subdued. I think if you can subdue an animal, you can subdue your pet, you can subdue your horse or whatever it is, um, you've done what James is talking about here. Um, people uh, have taught lions and tigers and monkeys to jump through hoops. People have taught parrots and canaries to speak and sing. They have charmed snakes. They have trained dolphins and whales to perform various tricks and tasks. 
Uh, I, I just like quickly a story from my being in uh, the Bronx Zoo with my grandson many years ago. Uh, we rode, he and I, Kathy, we rode a uh, subway all the way down to Coney Island and there's a, a, an aquarium there. And so we were at the aquarium and we decided to go to the big pool tank area where the um, sea lions would swim and do their tricks. They were definitely subdued. <laughs> and I just remember I was sitting on a, uh, we were sitting on a, a aluminum benches and we were kind of, here's the pool and here's the deck of the pool and then there was this wooden block. They were stationed all around the pool so the spectators would get a front row seat. And so I was sitting there holding my grandson Wells on my lap and, and this uh, trainer told that did some kind of signal and the sea lions would jump in the water and swim all the way across and come up on the deck and then climb up on the box and they would stare at the spectators. And if you know sea lions up close, they are really ugly and it was really big and I didn't hear anything out of Wells. And then this sea lion, I don't know if it was on cue, but he made the most awful sound. It was just like, <laughs> and my grandson was really quiet. And we kind of watched the rest of the show and everything for a little while, and I didn't think much. And then he just turned to me and said, I want to go home. <laughs> I just want to go home. It was a long subway ride back to Brooklyn, but anyway. So, uh, yeah. So animals can be subdued. That would be the better, better translation. All animals have been controlled, but not necessarily domesticated. Um, apart, and here's the point for you and me. Uh, and that is, apart from the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, it's impossible. We cannot do it. In fact, what we're learning with the men on Wednesdays is uh, that there's a, there, there must be a daily commitment that as I get out of bed this morning, Lord, I want to not let anything come out of my mouth that I shouldn't. Lord, I want that. Lord, I want to speak to my wife or I want to speak to my, my husband the way that I should. I want to talk to my children. I want to let people that I work with, what comes out of my mouth. That's my commitment. Today, I will do that. But then, always, at the end of that is, but I can't do that without you, without your power in my life, without the Holy Spirit who lives within me. I can't live that way. And it might need to be more than just once a day, but at least once a day, we ought to get up and say, Lord, I want to control what comes out of my so, I think that's what we're talking about here. Apart from the Holy Spirit's help, no human being has ever been able to subdue his or her own tongue. Number three, we're getting close, James, uh, James 3, 9 through 12. He just kind of talks about the inconsistency because we can do these things. We, can, we are inconsistent. James says in James 3, 9 through 12, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And the Jewish people, the rabbis, would go around and they had a way that they would bless God out loud all the time. And so I think that James is probably thinking about them with their tongues blessing God, blessing God, but having trouble with what they say. So we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God from the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing. Is that you? Is that me? Sometimes. Sometimes, because we have to work at it. Sometimes we bless God. Sometimes we sing hymns. Sometimes we worship God, and then we go home and get on the phone or sit across the coffee table or the coffee shop and gossip and so on. So James is talking about the inconsistency. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives 
or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce, produce fresh. We honor God with our words, but we turn right around and dishonor God with what we say. I think you're getting the point. The lesson is that he who curses him who, has, who is made in the image of God implicitly curses the prototype as well. You curse your wife, you curse your family, you curse someone you work with. You're really ultimately cursing the one who made them. You're cursing uh, the prototype. So that's, I think, what James is teaching. And uh, so we're going to come down to uh, some applications and then we'll be done. <clears throat> to bless God is the sublimest function of the human tongue. Um, it is the pious practice among Jews, but there is this contradictory phenomenon, and it is speaking contrary to the will of God. Although the believer has in the indwelling Holy Spirit the potential for controlling the tongue, he may not be appropriating this potential. <clears throat> so, um, you might be one of these people. I don't know if you've ever said this or if you heard someone say this. And we just need to think about this. But you might be someone who says, I always speak my mind. No matter who gets hurt. And there's, there's a good thing with speaking your mind, right? I mean, rather than hiding truth and, and not speaking, but there's a way to do it. But someone might say, I always speak my mind, and it's not my fault if they get hurt. But James would say, in answer to that, discipline your speaking. Mm -hmm. Keep it, keep the bit, the bit and the bridle on it. Learn to control it. Someone else might say, I know I gossip too much. <laughs> oh, man. I just can't help it. And what would James say about that? He would say, um, control your tongue. That's what he would say. And someone else might say, um, we might have a habit of speaking with insults and ridicule. I mean, Shane comes really close to that with me all the time. <laughs> He's going to have to sort that out, but it's getting close, Shane. I'm just telling you. But, uh, so someone might have the habit of speaking with insults and ridicule or sarcasm. And James would say, change your speech habits. That's what he would say. I don't think he's telling us to shut up. I don't think he's telling us to not talk. He's not talking about that. He's saying we need to bridle the speech that God gives us. He expects us um, to discipline. Uh, he expects discipline to be happening in the life of the Christian. And he would say there's no justification for corrupt habits of speech. Okay. Here's some principles and then we'll be done. Number one, remember, first of all, that controlling what comes out of our mouth is a really hard thing to do. No one is standing up here saying it's easy. No one here is saying that it's a really hard thing. In fact, James seems to say it's the hardest thing to do. And then, secondly, you need to read and meditate what the Bible says about dealing with the tongues. And I would just say read Proverbs. Read it over and over again. Solomon had his own problems in life, believe me. But he said 150 times, this is a big problem for us. So read Proverbs. Number three, develop a sense of humor. <laughs> That's what Shane does for me. He's developing my sense of humor. Um, Maybe you have become testy. Maybe you have become negative. Maybe you can only see the glass half empty or half full. Um, maybe you're tired. Maybe you're cranky. Maybe you're complaining. Maybe you're a grumbler. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're burned out. I don't know. But I think we need to develop a sense of humor because without that, our speech is probably going to be pretty, pretty, uh, unedifying. <laughs> um, so develop our sense of humor. Um, 
And then um, I would say a really, really good thing for us to work on is to work on listening. I mean, if you, if you want to control your tongue, just shut up. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I mean that nicely. But you won't say as many bad things if you be quiet and listen. And, um, you know, I don't think I'm a great listener to my wife. I'm, I'm ashamed to say that. I really am. I, I try and I try and hear things and respond, but... Uh, this week, I, we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, I, I've heard Dee say, I, I told my wife finally one time, honey, I will listen to you for as long as you want, whenever you want. Anytime, I will listen to you. And man, I was, I was thinking, I think I'm a pretty good listener, but I'm not. And so we're going to get together every Monday morning and either have coffee or sit down together or go out to breakfast or something and I'm going to listen to Kathy. I am. I promise to do that. And we put it on the calendar and uh, we're going to work on listening more and speaking less. I think it's good. So I'm, I'm in the same game as you are. I'm trying. So let's pray and we're going to sing a song and then we'll be dismissed, okay? Father, thank you for the Word of God. It's so practical. And we all live there. We all have mouths. We all have um, things in our hearts that need to be cleansed. And uh, we need to be forgiven of so much. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I thank you that you continually prod us and poke us. And you want to conform us to the image of the only perfect one. And that's Jesus. So I pray that you would do that in our lives, Father. We love you. We pray that this week we will listen more and uh, ask you for help as we bring our tongue under control. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So let's stand up and sing. Oh, boy, if there's any song that's appropriate, it's Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God. Let's stand and sing it together.